I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm fine, and I had the most fun this week. What did you do to have the most fun? I went to the circus, and I saw all kinds of animals. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Yes, I just love animals, especially elephants. Especially when they blow water through their noses like a fountain. Yes, I love elephants, too. Oh, and I, and I know a riddle, too, that I heard in the circus. Good, what is it? What is the difference between an elephant and a flea? Uh, a one's bigger than the other. That's true, but that's not the right answer. Um, well, what is the right answer? An elephant has fleas, but a flea doesn't have elephants. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's very good. <laughs> now, please read me the funny. Fuck the comic weekly. Yes. Very well, I will in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, hop along, Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for hop along. A telegraph man was attacked by a mountaineer and his dog because the mountain people didn't want anyone putting in a telegraph line. In the struggle, the telegraph man was pushed over a cliff and fell into a river where he was found by Hoppy and his pals. A little later, a lovely girl came along and identified the man as her brother. Today, California says, as they look at the unconscious man, Yeah, this young fella's plumb lucky we were passing through in time to drag him from the river. Where'd you come from, ma'am? The girl answers, Our base camp. I'm his sister, Gail Sparks. Ken failed to return from a survey trip from a new telegraph line out of Denver, and I came looking for him. First picture next row as they lift the man to the horse. Hoppy says, Well, he'll be all right. Must have lost his footing on some cliff ledge. The girl answers... Or was pushed. They climb into the saddles, and as they get underway, the girl says, last picture, second row... Ever since line construction reached this area, we've had strange accidents. Supply wagons burned, equipment wrecked or stolen, teams run off. Unless it stops, our work crew threatens to quit. Big picture, middle of the page, Hoppy says... Hey, it sounds like somebody's mighty anxious to keep that telegraph line from going through. They come into a clearing out of the trees, and the girl says... There's our camp ahead. And a moment later, they're in the camp, surrounded by a group of burly men, workers for the telegraph company. The girl tells them, first picture, fourth row... Ken's had an accident. A couple of you men better help carry him to his tent. Hoppy hands her brother down to two of the men. And then as he dismounts, last picture, fourth row, the girl suddenly says... The rest of you grab these strangers. I lured them here because I'm convinced that they're responsible. California exclaims, Hey, you mean you tricked us? First picture next row, the girl says... I wasn't fool enough to swallow your pack of lies. You've blocked this project for the last time. First picture bottom row, like a bursting dam, the enraged workmen swarm in, engulfing their victims. While last picture, the only one who can save Hoppy and his friends, lies unconscious. Oh, that's wrong. Because Hoppy saves the girl's brother, and then she tries to get Hoppy beat up by those men. Yes, it is. It's very wrong to suspect people without any real good reason. I should say it is, but I wish that girl's brother would wake up so he could tell everybody that Hoppy was a hero and was good to him. Well, let's hope that happens next week. Now? Well, I'm sure that Prince Valiant must be on page three. Well, let's take a look and see. All right. Yes, there he is. And you remember last week that after two years, Arf returned home to see his father, and his father was so happy to see him. Yes, but I wonder about Arf's stepmother. Remember, she was so mean to Arf that that's why he left home. Oh, yes, I wonder about that. Let's read now and find out. Very well, here we go with Prince Valiant and the days of King Arthur. Hecate, Breckett, Grey Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> After two years of wandering and adventure, Arf Jeffrey returns to his father's house. He is minus one leg and his desire to become a great warrior. But no whining cripple is he, but a clear-eyed, confident youth who knows what he wants and intends to get it. 
Big picture, top of the page, Arf presents his guests. His patron, his hero, the great Sir Valiant, Prince of Thule, Knight of the Round Table. Next, Sir de la Cie, wealthy importer. And then, suddenly very shy, Arf murmurs, And this is Adele. Arf's father can tell by Arf's manner that he's in love with a girl. So first picture next row, under shaggy brows, Sir Geoffrey glares at the girlish face. So it is, with this per trick, he must share his boy's affection. Oh, well, they're still very young. And he orders that Arf's guests should be entertained in the greatest style. Finally, all good things must come to an end, and so the guests depart. But before they do... Arf and Adele, sitting before the fire that night, pledge eternal devotion, and they also make some common-sense plans. And then Arf and Adele, the next morning, separate, and she goes with her father on his way. Last picture, middle row, assisted by his old tutor, Torlay, Arf goes to his father's great library for he's hungry for the wealth of knowledge and beauty that crowds the books on the dusty shelves. About this time, some 50 miles away, King Arthur, Sir Launcelot, and Gawain, first picture bottom row, are walking in the Hall of Champions, where hang the shields of all knights present and ready for service. Suddenly they halt and stare at a shield and sword that had not been there before. It is a singing sword that belongs to Val, the greatest fighter in the kingdom. The king, with a twinkle in his eye, pulls his golden beard and mutters, mm, Now what have I done to deserve this? And Launcelot says, last picture, I suggest, sire, we find the comparative quiet of some battlefield until he is gone. But Gawain shouts, Bring on the pipers! Call out the dancing girls! Broach the wine casks and tune up the fiddles. Young Scatterbrain is back again. Oh, Val has surprised us. Yes. He came back to the palace after he left Arf, didn't he? I'm afraid so, and King Arthur didn't know that Val is back. And Val must have a special surprise up his sleeve. He must have, and maybe next week we'll see more about that. Oh, goody. Well, now... Donald Duck. Well, it might be. Let's turn over the page. Past Perry Mason, go past the Lone Ranger, and there on page five. Donald Duck, oh, good for a chuckle. Say the magic words with me. Squeeze, squeeze jump, jump, squeeze, jump, squeeze, jump, squeeze, 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 Dewey's toy plane whirs right past his nose, almost clipping it off. It sails around the room, right past Dewey's nose, almost clipping it off. And around the room it sails again. Donald yells third picture. Come on, we gotta catch it before it bites something. And away they go after it. Through the dining room they go. Into the living room. Dewey, first picture, bottom row, sees the plane heading for him. He picks up a chair cushion, and the plane sails right at him. And Dewey has caught it. Donald scolds Dewey, next picture. I told you not to fly that in the house. You must have to... Dewey replies, Hey, I'm sorry. Donald opens the door, points outside, saying, Fly it outdoors, where it's safe. Out Dewey goes. <laughs> Donald slams the door. And Dewey turns the plane loose outdoors. Up in the air it goes. Makes a circle. Heads for the house. And... Last picture, Donald sees a broken window and the toy plane standing nose down in the fishbowl. And he goes... Ah! And the fish goes... <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Donald can't blame that on Dewey because he took it outside just like Donald told him to yes, do. Yes, he did. And I'm afraid what Donald should have done was tie a string on the plane for Dewey so it wouldn't have gotten away from him. Yes, tie a string to it. Then you can fly without it breaking anything or hurting anybody. That's a very safe thing to do. Yes, a very safe thing to do. Well, now shall we see what's happening with Dick's adventures? Oh, yes. I'm very anxious to read 
Hicks Adventures because he's having such an exciting time in the early days of America with George Washington and the Army, and they just won a big battle. Well, let's go over to the last page of the first section, and here we go with Dick's Adventures in Dreamland. Say the magic words with me. Riggedy pack a zack a zick. Let's have music for Adventurous Dick. In the middle of his dream, Dick wakes up, sits up sleepily, and says, oh, Say, we just won the Battle of Yorktown. Cornwallis and the British Army are surrendering to Washington, and oh, gosh, I've been dreaming about what happened in 1781. And then, still drowsy, he shuts his eyes again, and in his dream goes back, back, back. Last picture, top row, Dick finds himself in old New York. The year is 1783, December. The last of the Redcoats has left America. Dick asks a passing Continental soldier, Say, say, what is this place? He receives the reply, Francis Tavern, boy. Dick looks up at the sign and says, Francis Tavern? Why, that's where General Washington said farewell to the officers who fought by his side during the Revolution. Maybe it's happening now. But Dick goes into the building. And he enters a room where are assembled George Washington and all the brave generals who fought under him in the American Army for Independence. Impressive is this moment as his beloved comrades in arms face their commander-in-chief for the last time. Dick beholds the saddened faces of Nathaniel Green, Henry Knox, Anthony Wayne, Alexander Hamilton, Lafayette, Kosciuszko, Israel Putnam. But many are gone forever, fallen but not forgotten. Then Washington rises. There is a hush. There are tears in the eyes of many of the generals, hard-bitten victors of a bitter war. And there is a lump in George Washington's throat as he says, last picture, middle row. With a heart full of love and gratitude, I now take leave of you. I most devoutly wish that your latter days may be as prosperous and happy as your former ones have been glorious. Leaving Francis Tavern, Dick rides with Washington to Annapolis, where the Congress was then meeting. There, first picture bottom row, Washington officially resigns his commission to the Continental Congress as head of the General of the Armies of the American Forces and receives the thanks of the nation. Dick sees the tears in Washington's eyes and says, He's crying. That night, Christmas Eve, Dick goes with George Washington to Washington's home at Mount Vernon. Washington smiles and says as he dismounts, well, from now on, Dick, I'm a farmer. Nothing will take me away from my work. And then Washington goes into the house. Dick says, last picture, hey, but sir, you're going to be president, our first president. Oh, he doesn't even hear me. Oh, wasn't that sad when Washington said goodbye to his officers? Yes, it was. Dick was right. Washington was our first president, yeah. too. He was, and, and then now, will we find out more about what happened to him next week? I certainly hope so, because I love these stories about the early days of America. And then underneath Dick's adventures, here's Rusty Rally. And I'll read that in just a moment, but first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the bottom of the last page of the first section, Rusty Riley. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. <laughs> Tex and Rusty have learned that a horse that looked exactly like Queenie's horse, Snowflake had once been a very famous trotting horse named Rhina Blanca, and that the owner of the horse had been ruled off the tracks because it was suspected he had been dishonest. Tex thinks that Rhina Blanca and Snowflake are the same horse, and that the owner of the horse must be Queenie's father. They hope to clear Queenie's father's name and bring the real crook to justice. Today, Rusty is on his way to Queenie's place to see what he can find out. On the way, he meets Queenie. They sit down under a tree in the pasture and talk. Rusty asks her, third picture top row, Queenie, do you know if your father ever used another name when he was racing? 
Queenie answers that she doesn't know for sure because she and her mother had only been east for a few months and that they had a ranch in Arizona until her daddy got so poor. Rusty says, last picture, top row. Arizona, huh? Well, well, one other thing, Queenie. Did, did, did he ever like to wear soft shoes or moccasins? Queenie answers yes, that her mother was always buying them from the Indians and mailing them to him. A little later, first picture, bottom roll. Rusty is back at the Miles farm, and he's saying to Tex, Hey, Tex, I think we're on the right track. Queenie doesn't know if her father drove under the name of Catfoot Kendall, but she does know about his wearing moccasins. Yep, that's the way I figured, Rusty. Well, now, lad, if you aim to drive in a sulky race, you've got to learn something about it. I was just thinking. I hear they need a stable boy over at Grassy Acres. They breed standard breads. You can learn a lot about driving. Yeah, but Tex, my job's here with Mr. Miles. Oh, I'll square to Mr. Miles, Rusty. We'll just call it a leave of absence. I'm figuring if you keep your ears open... You might just learn something about that race when Queenie's dad was disqualified. Rusty exclaims, Cheapers, that's right, Tex. It was their sulky that he's supposed to have sabotaged. So that afternoon, last picture, Rusty applies for the job of stable boy at Grassy Acres. The owner, a husky fellow with his legs up on the desk, puffing a big cigar, is saying to Rusty... Okay, kid. I guess you'll do. Report to the wagon shed. Corny Bots will put you to work. Rusty answers, Yes, sir, Mr. Crumb. Thanks. Corny Bots? Why, that was the man, you remember, who that had the sulky that's been fixed so it would break. That's right. You remember very well. Yes, I do, don't I? You certainly do. Corny Botts is a very important name in this story. Well, maybe he's the one who did something crooked and then made it look like Mr. Kendall was to blame. Well, we'll find out more about that next week. That's a very clever scheme of Texas to have Rusty work at that other place because now maybe Rusty will hear something and he'll tell Tex about it and then they might find out that Queenie's father was not to blame. Well, let's hope so. Well, now what? Oh, now, now it's time for Blondie and Dagwood. And here they are on the first page of the second section. And we won't waste a second. Here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. Ramafoo, ramafum, zim, zam, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Dagwood is lying on the sofa trying to get a good day's rest when Blondie sweeps up the carpet. She complains that he has spilled tobacco all over it again. Dagwood rolls over and tries to take a nap. Just as he's about to drop off to sleep, Blondie comes in. She sees newspapers all over the floor. She tells Dagwood he's mussed up the living room, that he's lying on the sofa with his shoes on. So, Dagwood gets up and picks up the newspapers, thinking how sad it is that he can't get any rest. Last picture, top row, he's outside talking to Herb. He's telling him about his tough luck, and he says, I wish I had a little den of my own that I could muss up as much as I pleased. Herb says cheerfully, Well, why don't you build one in your cellar? That gives Dagwood a bright idea. First picture next row, Dagwood is leaving Herb's place carrying a lot of old lumber, saying with a smile, A room all my very own. Herb snickers to himself and tells his wife Tootsie, (laughs) I unloaded all that junk lumber on him for five (laughs) dollars. A few minutes later, Dagwood is in the cellar. He looks at one corner and says, I'll convert this little spare corner of the cellar into a little castle where I'll be king. And he starts working. Last picture of the row, Blondie comes down to the cellar and discovers that Dagwood has practically gotten one corner of the cellar pretty up very nicely into a nice little nook. Dagwood says, This is going to be a dream of a lifetime come true. Nobody allowed in it but me. And in no time at all, everybody in the neighborhood knows what Dagwood is doing. First picture next row, one of the neighbors gives Dagwood an old sofa. Another gives him a stuffed doll. Another one brings him a picture of John L. Sullivan, the famous boxer. Another one brings him a spittoon. Another brings him a phonograph that can play a spittoon. Second picture, third row, we find Dagwood painting his walls, surrounded by his trophies. And he says cheerfully, I can decorate it with my favorite colors, purple and yellow. Finally, it's evening. Last picture, third row. 
He calls his family down, and he points to the orderly little room, and he says, Behold, my hideaway is finished, and it's mine, all mine. And then, smiling, he goes upstairs to take a bath. First picture, bottom row, he's lying in the bathtub with a pad and pencil, making notes. And he says, Well, let's see now. I'll bring down my tobacco humidor, my magazines, my books and slippers, and it's complete. About an hour later, he goes downstairs to his little hideout, carrying his magazines and slippers, and finds Alexander lying on the floor, lifting his weight bar. Alexander says, It's swell for my gymnasium. He sees Cookie with all her toys, and she says... I'll keep my toys down here. Blondie stops her sewing machine, smiles at him, and says sweetly, It's the coolest room in the house. And Daisy and her five pups look at him and say, (laughs) Which means, You're the nicest daddy in the world. Dagwood's face drops. And he goes upstairs slowly. And last picture, he lies on the sofa and sighs philosophically. Well, anyway, I've got the rest of the house to myself. Oh, I think that was mean of everybody to take away his nice, pretty room after he worked so hard to fix it up. I do, too. And I think it was mighty nice of Dagwood to be so nice about it. Yeah, I think it was very nice of him to be so nice about it. I agree with you. Thank you. Now? Oh, here, underneath Dagwood and Blondie, here's Roy Rogers. You remember last week, uh, Roy was after the outlaws that had stolen the gold and had run away with it in the stagecoach. Yes, so let's read right now and see what happens. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. A yip yo now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip yo <laughs> Ballast, the big husky fellow, has made Beetle get into a big kite and flown him to the top of a very tall rock with steep sides. Quickly, Beetle ties a rope and pulley around a cleft in the rock. Ballast ties the box of gold dust to the rope as Jut, the leader of the outlaws, rides up in the rig he had stolen from Cube Root, Roy's friend. Jut says, Hiya, Ballast. I decoyed Roy Rogers with a stage, then grabbed Cube Root's buckboard. How's things going? Ballast replies, Great, Jut. You should have seen Beetle riding that kite to the top of the butte. <laughs> Jut jumps down. Hey, hurry up, hurry up, will you? Rogers is probably backtracking my trail right now. Ballast replies. Quit worrying, quit worrying. After I hoist the strong box up to Beetle on the top of the butte, nobody will know what happened to the gold shipment at all. And he gives a pull on the rock, and up, up, up goes the box of gold dust, third picture, to the top of the rock where Beetle is waiting for it. Suddenly, Beetle sees Roy heading their way, and he yells down, fourth picture, top row. Hey, ahoy, Jut, Ballast! Rogers and Ruder heading for the covered wagon. Hey, what about me, stuck up here? Quickly, Ballast and Jut scurry for cover. First picture, bottom row, Roy gallops around the bend. He sees the wagon beside a huge rock. He reins up. He says to Cube, Hey, look, covered wagon. Hey, Trigger, come here. Roy climbs up, climbs off the stagecoach, and on to Trigger. He says to Cube, Root. Now, you stay on the stage, Cube. Might be an ambush. Cover me with a rifle while I investigate. Cube answers, Well, I'm a bit awkward with firearms, Roy. However, I'm very handy with a slide rule. Roy rides down to the covered wagon, gun in hand. He reins up in front of it and calls, Anybody inside? Come on out with your hands up. There's a second of silence. Then, from behind a rock and back of Roy, Judge snarls, Don't move, Rogers. Quickly, Roy whirls Trigger around with his back to the covered wagon. Last picture, Ballast leaps out of the wagon at Roy. (laughs) Jut runs up from behind the rock, saying, Get away, Ballast. I'll plug this nosy cowpoke. Ballast snarls, No! I'll take care of myself with my bare hands. Trick. Yes, he's really in a tough spot now. Th- that ballast is twice as big as Roy. He's like a giant. He'll just crush him. Yes, you'd think he would. And that mean Judd is coming up with that gun in his hand, too. I wonder what'll happen. Well, I hope Cube Root is a good shot and will use that gun he's holding. But we'll find out more about that next week. I, I can hardly wait. Well, now let's go over the page. Oh, here's Flash Gordon on page two of the second section. You remember last week that uh, Flash finally escaped from the Martian ship? Yes, he had outwitted the Martians and saved Dale and the professor's niece, Ginger. 
And with a little rocket motor, he was heading toward the space platform. But what Flash doesn't know is that the leader of the Martians, that cruel little man named Toxo, has his gun in his hand, and he's waiting for Flash on the space platform. Yes, Toxo sees exactly what Flash is doing. So please read now so we can see what's happening. Very well, here we go with Flash Gordon. rig a rig a doon doon sash matash Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> The lurking Martian Toxo dodges into hiding when Dr. Ruff opens the airlock of the man-made space island. Flash lands with a last spurt of rocket power, and Ruff greets his lost niece tenderly. He demands gruffly, Hey, what was all this nonsense about Martians that you radioed? Flash points to the hovering interplanetary ship and asks, That looked like a mirage, Doctor? Last picture top row, while Dr. Ruff gasps in surprise, Toxo decides it's a good time to get rid of all the Earthlings on deck. But Flash was watching for the man from Mars. He shouts, Take cover, girls! They leap out of line of Toxo's cosmic ray shot. Fortunately, Flash's shout was just in time. Toxo, seeing that he has failed in exterminating the people from Earth, tries to escape. First picture next row, Flash's swift ray barrage drives Toxo headlong into space, zigzagging toward the protection of his own ship. He fires back at Flash in blind rage. Last picture... Toxo's parting shot hits a rocket tank on the space platform, and instantly liquid oxygen spurts out under terrific pressure, trapping Dale between the flames. Oh, my goodness, isn't that terrible? Just when I thought that Flash was going to get rid of Toxo, then all of a sudden his shot hits that tank. Yes, now he's apt to get away while Flash rescues Dale. Oh, do you think he'll be able to rescue Dale? He'll have to go through those flames, you know. She's in really terrible danger. Well, now, don't get excited. Flash is a hero, remember. And next week, we'll find all all about about that. Well, now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I've got to go now. All right, Mr. Tommy Gleagly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the Jolly Comic Weekly Man.